us uh, this, this afternoon, this evening in Buenos Aires. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many of you again. Um, of course, it would have been better to do so in person, not only to uh, see you directly, but also to enjoy the great food that I remember enjoying when I was in Buenos Aires last year. Well, uh, the topic of my talk today, I will touch on the subject that Susanna has raised on open access, which we certainly discussed last year, but I thought I'd broaden it a bit to talk about uh, the challenge of communicating science and really also to consider the public acceptance of science, which is, uh, has become an even greater challenge in the year since uh, we met. So let me start with some formal comments uh, that I've written uh, about my views about what we do as scientists. Uh, I'd like to focus on the foundation of that uh, enterprise that we're all engaged in. I trust that those of you who've logged on uh, to hear this presentation accept science and the scientific method as a source of solutions for our most pressing needs. Yet you will also be aware that uh, of many who dismiss science as the work of elites who are not connected to the realities of the world. Regrettably, too many of us retreat from the general ignorance of science to pursue our own scholarship, focusing instead on those few colleagues who appreciate the details of our research subject area. However, since we rely on the wisdom of our government, uh, representatives and philanthropies to support our work, we must address the basis of our belief that science provides the future to prosperity. Let me start by addressing what is obvious to all of you, namely what we do as basic scientists. Science progresses by the slow and steady accumulation of observation, theory, and experiment. Facts are established only after extensive and sometimes critical evaluation with opposing sides contesting alternative results and interpretations. Uh, the 20th century Austrian-born British philosopher of science, Karl Popper once wrote, quote, science must begin with myths uh, and with the criticism of myths. For Popper, science is unique in its systematic approach to errors and its emphasis on self-correction. Popper was best known for his doctrine of falsifiability, that is the importance of the testability of a hypothesis. In other words, what distinguishes the scientific method from other methods of investigation is that it's a method of attempting to discover the weaknesses of a theory to refute or to falsify the theory. Science has nothing to do with the quest for certainty or probability or reliability, wrote Popper. We're not interested in establishing scientific theories as secure or certain or probable. We're only interested in criticizing them and testing them, hoping to find out where we are mistaken. This really is the basis of what most of us do all the time in terms of scientific publication. Now, as examples, our knowledge of the earth and of the universe and the, uh, the principle of biological evolution are solid products of the scientific method having been established or tested at least over centuries of investigation. And yet uh, the scientific method holds that these principles must remain subject to skeptical inquiry and refinement. But the challenges must themselves be based on scientific reasoning and not the dogma of skeptics who would rely on myths from thousands of years ago that are not themselves subject to the scientific method. Uh, such skeptics come and go, but the fruit of human knowledge will remain and advance. In the United States, uh, we here face a new skepticism grounded in the politics of energy and commerce, challenging the scientific consensus view that our climate is influenced by human activity. We must welcome uh, skepticism, but again, the challenge must be on the basis of experiment, observation, and theory, not blind dogma. We hear arguments that the jury is still out and that we must continue to observe, which of course is true, but the arguments ring hollow when it comes to the application of our knowledge to public policy 
And they remind us of the US congressional testimony of the executives of the tobacco industry who in 1994 asserted that, quote, cigarettes may cause lung cancer, heart disease, and other health problems, but the evidence is not conclusive, unquote. Sound familiar? Yeah. We face a determined opposition. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, Randy. Are you sharing, are you showing slides? Because we are oh, not- Oh, no, this is just a preamble. I'll get ah, to the good, slide. good, good. Just, just checking that we are okay with the technical things. Good, oh, that's fine. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. This is my preamble. Okay. We face a determined opposition that would misrepresent the prevailing view of ex expert scientists, and worse yet, would attempt to expunge from government sources uh, any mention of climate change and cut off funding uh, for continuing to advance the science, even while asserting that the science must continue. But how can we continue without funding or access to the store of knowledge already accumulated by government scientists? Fortunately, much of the rest of the world, and I hope this is true in Argentina, appears to accept the reality of anthropogenic climate change and climate science is advancing with the added force of commerce where employment in renewable energy industries in my home state of California is accelerating at a pace far outstripping the fossil fuel industry. Here is a grand problem that knows no geographic boundaries, one that we must embrace with international collaboration. Okay, now I'd like to turn um, for my uh, presentation to a, a particular aspect of this problem, which is uh, the challenge that we face in the communication of scientific research. This is a subject that I touched on last year in my talk about open access. But as I said, I wanna expand this theme to illustrate two important points about the communication of science that bear on what I just said about our quest uh, to test scientific ideas and the rigor of scientific ideas through experiments that seek to criticize these, these uh, results. Now, unfortunately, one of the major challenges that we face in the public acceptance of science is the communication in some cases of work that has been um, uh, not adequately documented or in the worst of circumstances has been uh, the result of um, misbehavior on the part of certain scientists. Now, this is uh, not a common experience, but as I hope to convince you in the next few slides, it is a very dangerous thing that we as scientists must uh, seek to control. Now, let me give you some uh, really quite dramatic examples of scientific misconduct, misconduct and the effect that this has had with several very prominent publications eventually being retracted. Perhaps the most prominent and dangerous one was a publication in a journal called The Lancet, a publication of, uh, of the publisher Elsevier, um, by a British physician by the name of Andrew Wakes Wakefield, now some nearly 20 years ago. And you'll recall this, I'm sure, because this fellow claimed on the basis of what turned out to be um, manipulated data that there was a relationship between vaccination and autism. Now this paper was eventually retracted uh, by, by uh, Lancet, but it was only 12 years after the publication. And you might wonder why this work was published in the first place. Well, it turned out the publisher thought this was such a sensational story that in spite of objections on the part of the scientific reviewers and even the in-house editorial staff, this paper was published. And the damage that it, it has caused continues to reverberate around the world with um, an anti-vaccination attitude that will challenge the way we can effectively uh, bring to a close this sordid chapter of our current pandemic. I don't know what it's like in Argentina, but in the US, there remains a major concern with these really tremendous vaccines that are being developed. Uh, of um, uh, skepticism that will prevent a lot of people from even taking the vaccine. So this kind of misconduct, scientific misconduct can cause enormous damage. There are two other, there are many other papers that are listed here. Um, 
uh, on papers in uh, many of the most prominent journals, Science, Cell, Nature. Uh, there, was, there were two Nature papers uh, at the very bottom of this list that were published about five years ago, where the remarkable claim was made that um, adult differentiated cells could somehow be turned into human embryonic stem cells by simply exposing the cells to low pH. This caused quite a sensation because it would have been a revolutionary technical advance. Um, and the young woman who did the work returned as a conquering hero to Japan to be given enormous resources to create her own lab. Only within a few months of the publication of this work, it became clear that it was um, uh, not reproducible. Uh, no one could reproduce the results. On closer inspection, it was clear that the work had been, uh, that the papers were um, manipulated and there was plagiarism. Uh, it was a scandal in Japan. This woman lost her research position and was kicked out of science. A more senior investigator associated with the work was so humiliated that he committed suicide several months after this uh, uh, scandal broke, broke out. So the, the challenge that we face is, is enormous and we must be more active in policing ourselves. Um, now, let me give you another example of where this has had um, uh, a, a very profound effect. Um, eight years ago, <clears throat> um, a study conducted by an investigator at the biotechnology company Amgen um, um, was conducted completely internal in the, uh, in the, in the uh, organization. Uh, because they were concerned that much of the work that they relied on for clues for cancer chemotherapeutic targets could not be, the, the published work could not be reproduced in their laboratory. They were very concerned about this, so they set out themselves to try to uh, exactly reproduce the studies and found that of the most important publications in cancer biology in the prominent journals during the preceding years, only 11% of the key observations could be reproduced in their laboratories. This was astounding. So they published a, a summary of their studies um, with the lead author being this fellow Glenn Begley shown here. They published their studies in Nature. Unfortunately, the details of their uh, inspection were not made available because it was frankly not in their commercial interests to, to, to uh, identify the flaws that they had found. But, but this caused quite a stir, I'm sure around the world and governments, certainly in America, the governments became very concerned that the work uh, that they were spending billions of dollars to support with public funds was fraudulent and could not be reproduced. Mr. Begley, who's an Australian gentleman, I met um, a few years ago on a trip to, uh, to Sydney, and he told me of something that he had reported publicly and that I've reproduced in the next slide about his attempt to visit uh, with one of the principal investigators of the study they found they could not reproduce. And it became clear from his investigation and in the, in the quote that I'll give you in a moment that uh, the major problem is that some people and because of the pressure to publish in certain journals will cherry pick their data and only present the few observations that fit their uh, their theory this is not how science should be done we should be more objective in criticizing our own work not trying to prove something well here's the quote which is uh, still quite remarkable begley met for breakfast at a cancer conference with the lead scientist of one of the problematic studies he said, we went through your paper line by line, figure by figure, and ex he explained that we redid their experiment 50 times and never got their results. He, the principal investigator said, they'd done it six times, got the result they wanted once and put it in the paper <clears throat> because it made the best story. I mean, it's unbelievable that someone would admit to this, <clears throat> but of course, I'm afraid <clears throat> this is more common than one might, uh, might think, uh, that um, the pressure, and I'm sure I made this point <clears throat> in my talk last year, the pressure that uh, young investigators feel to have a big breakthrough, uh, to make their career, to make a paper that would be accepted by one of these uh, prestige journals is so great 
that sometimes they will bend the rules and um, uh, commit um, fraud or uh, pick only those results that are favorable. This is a this is a danger, not only to the progress of science, but to more importantly to the public acceptance of science. People can be skeptical when they see this kind of information, and and this this is this defeats everything that we attempt to do. So partly in response to efforts such as at, at Amgen and other companies. I was then the editor in chief of a new open access online journal called eLife. And we uh, participated along with an organization called the Center for Open Science to conduct our own rigorous uh, re-review and repetition of the experiments in the major more recent papers in cancer biology that had been published in the preceding period of time. This organization called the Center for Open Science identified 50 such papers. They raised some funds, not enough to conduct a thorough investigation. But uh, finally, um, of some 37 papers, we conducted two published studies on these papers uh, in the form of registered reports and replication studies. The registered reports were conducted by um, uh, contract laboratories who agreed for a fee to propose to repeat certain key experiments in these papers. And they uh, then wrote um, a manuscript on what they proposed to do exactly. And their manuscripts were, were reviewed by our editorial uh, board members, academics around the world. And they were criticized and there was a back and forth. And eventually we published uh, these registered reports. Uh, these were not the studies themselves. These are just, here's what we're gonna do. And we think this will be an adequate test. Um, those studies that were published were then commissioned to do replication work. And they then conducted these studies and they presented the results. Uh, and they were again reviewed by uh, the members of our editorial board and uh, many of them were criticized, uh, but a number of them eventually were published. And the results were a little disconcerting. Uh, and we learned from this very uh, uh, lengthy experiment ourselves that there are real challenges in reproducing things in the life sciences. We found, for instance, that um, in the first five studies, two of them could, the results could be reproduced two of them really couldn't be reproduced. And one of them, we just couldn't even get the experiment to work properly. And uh, we don't, in many instances, we don't think that this was fraud. We just think that in biology, uh, the reagents that one uses to conduct these studies change. The, the cell lines change, the antibodies change, the source, commercial source of reagents changes. And uh, one of the flaws in the replication study that was really handed to us by this Center for Open Science was, their position was that the replication study, the registered report had to be based entirely on what was written in the original publication. Now the, the authors of the original publications offered to help, but we were not allowed to seek their help because the point was to, to try to reproduce what was in the papers. And the hope was that these papers would be reproducible long after the initial investigators were gone. But that's a problem. That's not the way science really works. When you are doing an experiment following a published protocol and you have problems, you off, you'll often call the author of the paper or you'll sometimes visit that person's laboratory and can iron things out. But that wasn't what we did and we were forced to do in this study. And so, here in science in a review article of our efforts, uh, we were able to simply say that, you know, we could reproduce some, but not all the results, but the, res the ones that we couldn't reproduce, we certainly could not conclude that it was, a, it, that it was fraudulent. Uh, so it's, a, it's tough. The scientific process requires iteration and many investigations and eventually things that are not true uh, will be, uh, removed uh, from the canon of knowledge. Now, I wanna talk about another problem, which I'm sure I addressed last year, and that is the challenge of peer review. This is a nightmare that some young people have about when they send their paper off to a competitive journal, what they're facing, these evil people 
the anonymous reviewers who are going to determine the fate of their work. Uh, and eventually yes. one hopes that the, the work will be will be accepted, but not after not until a, after a traumatic experience. And um, and I'm sure I made this point last year and I continue to believe this part of the problem that we all face in the world uh, of uh, basic science is that the gatekeepers of knowledge are often these commercial journals like Nature or in the Life Sciences Cell or or Science Magazine, where the uh, gatekeepers themselves are professional editors who are hired by the journals, by the publishers, to sell magazines. They are themselves people who were trained as scientists, often having completed postdoctoral work, but many of them uh, have long since not, not seen the inside of a laboratory. Um, and yet they are called on to consider the work in broad areas of science, much, much broader than their own experience. Of course, they rely on uh, active scholars to render opinions about the work in the form of reviews, but it's up to these professional editors finally to decide what gets in, what gets reviewed and what gets in. And they are under pressure, I will, I, I insist they are under pressure to favor work that is popular, um, uh, that is um, uh, going to create a lot of interest. And that interest will be measured often by the number of times a paper is cited. And that's, um, that's a problem. Uh, um, there are many instances of papers uh, that report uh, revolutionary discoveries that don't resonate immediately with the public. One of my favorite examples was work that led to uh, eventually to Nobel prizes in the discovery of the circadian clock. The work began many years ago, 40 years ago or so, in the laboratory of a very famous geneticist by the name of Seymour Benzer at, the, at Caltech. Benzer had a graduate student uh, and the two of them had an idea that they might be able to study the natural rhythm, a circadian rhythm in the fruit fly by isolating a mutant that had an altered rhythm, an altered clock. They isolated the first such mutant uh, that had an altered clock. Therefore, there was one gene controlling this behavior. There turned out to be more, but one gene at least. This paper was published in the, a journal uh, called the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the PNAS. That paper was a revolutionary paper, and yet it was cited a total of 10 times in the next 10 years. 10 citations over 10 years. That paper would never have even been reviewed or published in one of these high profile journals because it would not have been sufficiently interesting at the moment. And that's a problem. And that problem is exacerbated by journals that favor the use of a measure, a metric, called the journal impact factor. Here's a, uh, an example that I may have used last year from Nature Magazine some years ago, where in their advertisement, they advertise this number, which I've argued is really a phony number. It measures the, um, the average number of citations that papers in their journal get uh, over a two year window. That's the two years after a paper is published. This is the average number of citations. Of course, that means that only those papers that are going to be instantly uh, favorable and, um, and uh, generate interest will be cited subsequently. Revolutionary papers will likely not be uh, cited and thus they will not be favored by journals that, you, that rely on this number. Now, fortunately nature, at least in public, has eschewed the use of this number, though on private, I'm sure they, they still embrace it. And the then editor of the journal, um, Philip Campbell uh, noted that it was time to reconsider the use of this number. He said, metrics are intrinsically reductive and as such can be dangerous, relying on them as a yardstick of performance rather than as a pointer to underlying achievements and challenges usually leads to pathological behavior. The journal impact factor is such a metric. And yet years later after this editorial was published, uh, I'm sure you realize that many scholars still favor journals 
that have a high impact factor because they think that is the key to success. And this continues to be a culturally embedded problem that we all face. In China, the problem was even worse. It turns out that people, that, that scholars in China were, were rewarded for publishing in high profile journals. This was an advertisement that was sent out by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I may have used this in my lecture last year. Uh, where if you were one of the lucky few to win the lottery and get your paper published in these premier journals, Cell, Nature, and Science, you were rewarded with personal cash, uh, to, which translates to roughly 33,000 US dollars just for the, the privilege of having published one of these papers. So this was, um, this was really a shock. Uh, and, and on my very frequent trips to China in the years after this, I made a point of advertising this. And I understand that the Chinese Academy of Sciences no longer uses this consideration. And the official uh, government position in China now has, has gone away from considering these kinds of phony numbers, journal impact factor. Well, what, what can we do to uh, turn the corner on this? Um, one thing that's very important that I'm sure I stressed last year and will stress again is uh, we as, as scientists, as active scholars, must eschew the use of impact factor. And so a number of us uh, who served as journal editors some years ago gathered in San Francisco to produce a document called DORA, the Declaration of Research Assessment, DORA San Francisco, which you can go online to see. And the recommendations were numerous to including moving away from impact factors, um, assessing the work on its own merits by uh, you know, reading the papers and having scholars in that area comment on the importance of the work uh, and using other approaches. <clears throat> this uh, document has now been embraced by institutions around the world and by tens of thousands of investigators. And yet um, in the face of um, uh, continued resistance. Uh, investigators embrace this number, unfortunately, and continue to favor these journals because um, people in leadership positions, and I'm sure I made this point, uh, at institutions have uh, find this number as an easy uh, alternative to actually evaluating the scholarship. So here are some suggestions that I uh, promote for, for journals. Uh, the journals, particularly the, the, the most selective journals, must learn to own their mistakes, to fess up to their own mistakes. They should be willing to provide space in their journals for the publishing publication of work that challenges other work that they published. And unfortunately, the most high profile journals are very reluctant to do this. I've had many uh, bad experiences uh, with others who have found uh, they are unable to get the ear of the publishers in these uh, journals. Um, I think a, a more open review process, uh, such as what we did at eLife, where the reviewers confer with each other before the decision is rendered, and where the journal publishes the comments of the reviewers, uh, even uh, whether they're signed or unsigned, along with the article, so that you can look behind the curtain and see what went on in the evaluation of the work. And uh, there should be a way to change uh, the investigation of claims of publication misconduct. Uh, right now, when a claim of misconduct is uh, reported to the journal, the journal finds they, the journals are ill-prepared to investigate, so they turn it back to the home institution, the institution where the investigator who's been challenged is a faculty member, and this represents a clear conflict of interest. And there should be some other way of handling such investigations. Um, increasingly, and this has been an uh, enormous uh, benefit during the pandemic, uh, journals uh, have allowed uh, the work that's about to be submitted to be posted on preprint servers. In the life sciences, there are the bio archive and the med archive. In physics, it's the physics archive. These archives are enormously valuable. and uh, the journals, even the commercial journals during the pandemic have allowed work um, that they've published or work that's on preprint servers to be 
openly accessible to everyone around the world. And as a result of seeing these publications immediately, it's been possible to have many more eyes on each paper and to find flaws that would not have been found um, in the traditional system where only two or three experts are looking at a paper. So this um, has been a real eye opener during the pandemic, especially. And papers on COVID that have been posted on these archives have been immediately challenged because everyone looks at this. So I think this is a this is a uh, an enormously valuable trend. And uh, just to conclude, then uh, I urge all wherever I go to stop advertising this foolish journal impact factor and use other means to evaluate scholarship, embracing the principles of Dora and openness in the review process and posting of work as soon as it's ready for public inspection. So thank you uh, again for the opportunity to visit with you and to uh, share my views. And um, there were a number of questions that came in uh, before the talk, but I'm happy to open the floor for others now. Thank you, Susanna and all of you in attendance. Thank you, Randy, for the marvelous talk. And then uh, if there are people, we have claps here from Rodrigo. Um, if there are people that want, we have some um, questions uh, that you very disciplined, you were very disciplined and you printed them, you said. Yes, I have them in front of me. So why don't I just repeat them? <laughs> You're doing my job, Randy. Oh, okay. I'm not read inviting them? you. But uh, Gabriella uh, Mataloni has asked, Open access is costly for researchers and frequently beyond funding reach for those from non-wealthy countries. How can this unfairness be, be avoided? This is, a, of course, a real problem. And I, I appreciate you know, the problem, uh, particularly in Latin America with, with restricted budgets. So, um, uh, but it's a problem even before open access. As I learned last year when I visited your country about uh, and spoke with one of the, you know, the ministers in your government, about uh, the outrageous fees that were being charged for licensing to the Elsevier Journal family, where the, the fees were per use in great excess over the fees that we have to pay here in, in the US. So, I mean, this is just outrageous. Elsevier continues to be a very bad actor. But uh, so the solution is only in part open access because of course there are fees. I, I know as a journal editor, it costs to publish. It's not just because you put it online doesn't mean it's free. There, there are many expenses. Mm -hmm. So many journals, and uh, I think the, you know, the, the, the ones that you should look to are the journals that are not for profit, but journals that, act, uh, that are published by not-for-profit organizations. And the good example is the, is the PNAS. Um, the, the PNAS is um, you know, an outstanding journal. I, I was an editor of the journal for some years. And um, their policy is to not make a profit, but they can't operate at a loss. They can't, uh, they have to be break even. And so they offer um, uh, to people from uh, less developed countries or where budgets are, are, are restricted, they, they usually can, uh, will excuse the open access fees for investigators who, who make that request. So I would, I would look to those journals. Uh, you won't get such a deal from nature, but, but you may very well get such a deal from the PNAS. Now, another thing uh, that you can do is to post the work online in one of the preprint servers. Uh, in fact, um, I'm, I'm involved in a new organization that's promoting basic science on Parkinson's disease. And we've told all of our investigators that they must publish in open access journals and moreover, when they submit the paper, they must assert in the, op in the letter of introduction, they must assert that this paper will be published with the most liberal uh, copyright license called Creative Commons CCBY license, and that the work will be gold standard open access. This is even before the publisher has agreed to review the paper. Further, um, through an organization that, that I'm part of called Coalition S, a European organization that promotes open access, we've learned that um, uh, uh, even after a paper is reviewed and even after it's accepted, you can post that paper on a public archive and the journal can't force you to take it down. 
they, they are likely legally restricted uh, from forcing you to take it down. So uh, you could go through the whole process, not pay anything uh, for, the, for the work. And if they then try to charge you to publish it as the version of record in their journal, if they aren't willing to negotiate that price with you, you can just say, the hell with you, I'm posting this paper on um, PubMed or Preprint Archive and, and, and not pay anything. So this is a new challenge to the commercial publishers. I think they're going to have to be willing to be, to be more flexible. So mm -hmm. this is not a, you know, this is not the, the final, the, you know, a final uh, fix to the problem. But I think you should favor those journals that are not for profit because they're more likely to be willing to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay uh, Armando. Um, Okay, so Armando has basically asked the same question, and I, I so I've, I hope I've given you some answer. Uh, Beatrice uh, Caputi asks, you donated the money for your Nobel Prize for research. Can you comment on this? To what cause would you donate your money if you won another big prize? Well, the, 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 the good and the bad of a Nobel Prize is once you win the Nobel Prize, you tend not to win any more prizes. So, <laughs> so I, uh, but, um, uh, I, I had, uh, I've been blessed. I've had um, good fortune in my life. And so when I won the prize, it was an easy decision that I made to donate the money to create an endowed chair in honor of my mother and sister who both died of cancer many years ago. And so I was, um, I was pleased to be able to do that, do this because I knew that by making that gesture that I would, I would encourage people who have, um, uh, who have deeper pockets to make additional donations. And so that happened very quickly and we were able to fully fund the endowed chair uh, through my initial gift. I've since now, because of other good fortune and been able to endow uh, fellowships, I'm endowing a chair at UCLA, my alma mater, and uh, two other fellowships here at Berkeley. So um, I think if, if we are in a position to, to, to do something, it's a gesture that other people who are friends of the university who have uh, greater means will we'll be encouraged to help. And uh, that's how we survive here at Berkeley as a public institution. We don't have the kind of money that Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford have, but we have enormous goodwill in the community because uh, of what we do. Um, uh, Maria Victoria Buhler asks, there's been a significant rise in global leaders who don't believe in science. I've addressed that point in my introduction with the increasing political fanaticism and polarization, how can the scientific community regain those groups trust and belief in science? Yes, this has been enormously challenging during this um, four years of the Trump regime here in the US. It's been very discouraging to see the dismissal of science. I mean, it's just, it's just appalling. And uh, uh, it's not, uh, you know, your neighbor in Brazil is, uh, is, is even worse. Uh, and what can you do? Well, one thing that we, I think could have done a better job is for the scientific societies who represent us, they should have been stronger in taking, taking a public stand. I've been a, a proud member of the US National Academy of Sciences for almost 30 years. And uh, I was, I've been very disappointed during the Trump regime, how little the academy has been willing to stick its neck out and take a public stand against what, what Trump and his, uh, and, and his enablers have done. Uh, the presidents of the National Academies, um, you know, they're, they're sincere, they work hard, they have the institution um, at their, in their hearts, but they aren't speaking with a louder voice that we have as, uh, as you know, as the most prominent scientist in the US our voice has been muted and only few people have been, have been brave enough to stand out. People like uh, Tony Fauci, our um, infectious disease expert and others around the world uh, are the rare voices uh, of courage that have spoken out in opposition to this attitude, um, anti-science attitude. So I, we could have done a better job. Thank God we have a new administration coming in that will value science. But, this, but the shock is, as you've seen, there are still 74 million people in this country who voted for Trump. 
and uh, it's just, I mean, it's, it's hard to understand. It's hard to explain. But I, I suspect you've had experiences in your country of similar nature. Uh, so this is something that we, we, we always have to deal with. And we, we need leaders who are willing to speak truth to power and not be uh, afraid. And I, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, I think it's been rather shameful actually, that they've not taken a stronger position. Um, okay, another question related to what I've already addressed by Pablo Aguilar, what business model for open access is compatible where an R01 in your country is the equivalent of $3,000 a year? Well, as I said, uh, look to those journals that will offer to negotiate the price of, um, of publication. And, um, and I, I would trust the not-for-profits over the commercial ones. Uh, Lucas Cabo asks, what can we as students do to improve the world we live in? Well, one thing is to reach out um, to uh, younger people and to share your enthusiasm for science. One of the things that, that brought me along when I was very young and really was the basis of my passion for science was uh, uh, the schools, the school system, uh, when I was growing up, had every year at each school, there was a science fair, even very young. Every year, students would do their own individual projects and present displays in science fairs. And uh, I first encountered this when I was 12 or 13 years old, and it, it just it was immediately resonated with me for some reason. And so every year after that, I, my major effort was for science, science fair projects. That, that really is what, uh, what has determined my path. And I, I don't know if this is traditional or not in Latin America. It's not as, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it's not as common now in the US and that may be part of the problem. Uh, this is something that we can, this is simple. This is something that teachers can do. And uh, young people can, can take this position. Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, even for those who are not gonna become scientists, just to see a little bit about how, how science is really done, not just reading books and sitting in lectures, but you know, actually doing little simple things themselves. This is what would turn people, turn students on to science, to, in my mind. Uh, and where, because we may call you for, we have a course that is called how to do research. Sure. And we were, because don't talk too much, because we might invite you in the virtual. <laughs> We were just talking about that, how to transmit uh, the concept of how to do science and the challenge for this year, it's, it's running in February, we are going to do a virtual uh, course, and sure. this is for students, uh, we want to attract them, to motivate them to become scientists, to, to have a, a feel for science, sure. so. Uh, okay. Well, you know, you know where to reach me. I warn you, that's, yeah, that's yeah. just. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's see. But thanks for the idea. That's that's something that it, 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 it resonates with us. Sure. Thank you. It's not expensive. You know, this was astonishing to me. When I was in uh, Sweden for the Nobel, um, they offered me the chance to go out and visit a, a gymnasium, a high school, uh, you know, where smart kids went to school and they sub studied all kinds of subjects. And they took me to a a room where there were displays, little simple displays in biology. Somebody had a microscope, they were doing frog dissection, little things like that. And I asked the students if they, uh, if they did uh, science fair projects, you know, where they did their own individual thing, just as I described. And they said, no, no, why? Why, why? well, the teachers don't do it. It's not, it's not something we do here. So I asked the, the principal of the school, the, the head headmistress, why don't you do this? And she said, well, we don't believe in competition of that sort. We don't like to put people against each other in competition. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You have athletes here, they compete. And by the way, you run the most competitive science prize in the world. <laughs> what do you mean you don't believe in competition? I just couldn't believe it. It's this attitude in Scandinavia of egalitarianism. It made no sense. It made no sense. Okay. 
that, that right. part is not a Sorry, uh, we have a question here. Uh, uh, Veronica Gomez, she raised her hand. Yes. Veronica, Veronica, would you like to ask a question? Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much for the chance. I, um, I work in human rights here at uh, the yes. Center of uh, Political Studies at the University of San Martin. So I come from social sciences. Mm -hmm. I work with scientists all the time. And uh, we work on, on preparedness, on issues that touch upon human rights, and in particular, the right to health, but other rights yes. and preparedness. So, so my question to you is, uh, is about uh, if, if you could uh, share a reflection on, on the role of the state and the connection with science, because we see um, uh, the increasing uh, role also of the private sector, you know, yeah. after I would say a couple of centuries in which the state really was at the center uh, yes. of, of, of action, you know, in terms of public policies. Yeah. But I think the last few months, particularly in the last few years, have been an example of, of, of the power of, of the private sector. Yes, yes. And sometimes it could be beneficial, as you mentioned, with yes. uh, climate change. Yes. Uh, but in, in other instances, you know, the conflicts of interest and, and other issues that you're bringing up when you're talking also about open, open source oh, yes. oh, science. Yes. So yes. What, what is your reflection about that? Because there's a changing panorama in front of us. Yeah. Well, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a capitalist. I believe in the free enterprise system, but it has to be checked. It, it, it can't be un, unfettered. Um, uh, you know, the tobacco industry is a, is a prime example of that. And, and now the uh, petroleum interests have, have enormous power in, in this country and uh, perhaps also in Argentina. The, you know, they, uh, the, the, the opposition to the prevailing view of anthropomorphic, uh, anthropogenic climate change that is put out by these um, powerful petroleum companies is as powerful as the tobacco industry was uh, 30 years ago. And so they, they, they need to be exposed. And this, this, so we need, we need public activism and not just governments. We need public activism to expose the truth and we need to elect uh, officials who share that view, who share uh, an appreciation, if not an understanding in science. And we, as scholars, need to be constantly educating our legislators. Um, scientific societies have a role, not just in promoting the scholarship of their members, but of informing our public elected officials. Uh, there's been a tradition uh, in the life sciences in the US, a uh, very active legislative lobbying on behalf of science and, um, and scientific understanding, scientific education. There are, there's, a, there's a major congressional caucus in Washington that is populated by many representatives of, of the elected uh, officials who sit in regular seminars where they uh, where they receive lectures from from uh, prominent scientists who are skilled at communicating. Um, and th this is where, uh, you know, as I said a moment ago, where the National Academy of Sciences has fallen down, I'm, I'm afraid. So you, you need in your, in your country as well to have scholars actively engaged in um, legislative outreach. I don't know if what the tradition is in Argentina, but in the US, most uh, legislative uh, office holders have someone, uh, or in the past they've had someone who was scientifically trained and can help them understand issues. And uh, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, with the opposite, with the antagonism to science, uh, that influence has waned, has 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 gone down. But it 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 it, it will now be renewed with the new administration and. Uh, uh, so we need, we need people who are not only good scientists, but skilled public speakers to go out and to inform legislators. It's maybe difficult to inform the general population, but, but the people who make the decisions need that information. So um, we can't rely on industry. Occasionally they'll have enlightened self-interest 
uh, uh, but we can't rely on them. Um, uh, they, they need to be they need to be regulated um, and they need and, and that regulation must be done by by legislators who are who have knowledge it's not a simple there's not a simple cure here what is the tradition in Argentina are are, um, are your elected representatives um, do they have staff members who are well informed on you know, in issues of, of, of scientific literacy? Silence, silence in the room. <laughs> the system is different. Not at all. Not our, at represent all. our representatives are not chosen by the local population. Uh, that is a difference with the US system. Oh, I see. So you, you, for example, are the winner party and you have a list of, uh, because of the amount of uh, um, voters that voted for you, then you get a chance to include uh, 35 representatives, all 35 of them go in, oh. in, a, in, a, in a plain list. They yeah. are not uh, voted by, we have one representative every 60,000 people, yeah. but that is just the amount that yeah. you can have, but you don't vote for them. I don't have a representative that I can call on the phone and say, hey, yeah. listen, yeah. I want this to be done this way, otherwise I won't vote for you. I, I see. can't. I see, so you have, uh... You're voting for a party more than a for a yeah. yeah exactly you vote for a party yeah in any case the answer is no <laughs> in any case the answer but, uh, is... just uh, I'm sorry I'm uh, I'm a lawyer so I have to say something uh, yes. but there are but there are you know the different mechanisms within yes. the legislative power by which consultations can be made. Yes, councils yes. also offer advice, you know, at the legislative level, but mostly I think it is at the executive level yeah. that yeah. you would have access to that sort of advice. Yeah. So, you know, the mechanisms exist. Yeah. Maybe they're not, you know, they're, they're not as, 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 as rich as, and, and as varied yeah. as, as the ones that you would have in Capitol Hill. Um, yeah. but, but, but it's not that, that there is a complete do, uh, absence of mechanisms. Do the um, do the academic uh, societies in Latin America? Uh, do they do they have public policy outreach efforts, or are they strictly looking inward at the, the you know the development of their own scholars? Veronica, I would say that they're mostly uh, looking inside out. Yeah. Well, there's something to do. Uh, you know, if you have, you know, we have uh, organizations in the U.S. that represent tens of thousands of scientists, mm -hmm. and they have, they have, you know, they they generate resources and they have lobbying, they have lobbyists mm -hmm. that go to go to Washington and lobby on their behalf uh, or on behalf of science. You know, the science budget in the U.S., particularly particularly for biomedical science survives whether there are Republicans or Democrats in charge. In fact, during the Trump regime, the budget of the NIH has gone up. Every year he proposes a drastic cut in the NIH budget, but every year Congress recognizes the importance of medical research and they, they, they increase the budget. I mean, it's, it's a miracle. And uh, partly it's because we, you know, we inform them and they learn about medical advances. They see the advantage of an investment in biomedical science that has turned biotechnology into a massive enterprise in this country. We see this, especially now in this pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I guarantee you, uh, when we come out of this pandemic, the biotechnology industry in the US is gonna be flourishing like it never has. We find our students uh, increasingly preferring to go into biotechnology than going into academic science because they see the, the rich opportunities. So this was, and this was, you know, the result of, of wise decisions, legislative decisions made many years ago, mm -hmm. where for instance, um, uh, university research can now uh, be much more easily patented than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you don't have to pay the government anything. You know, uh, they, uh, there was a very wise legislative decision made that encouraged university investigators to patent, to, a, to establish intellectual property and patent their observations. And as a result, 
all these biotech companies in the US are, have been started by academics with a good idea and who were able to raise uh, venture capital. And uh, this company Moderna that's made one of these uh, vaccines, you know, they're, I mean, they're gonna be fabulous. They're fabulously successful. And it's not- I, I, I think Randy, Randy you, you just described uh, what is uh, a high contrast with the situation here in, in Argentina. Argentina, and I would say in Latin America about the relationship between science and the economy. Yeah. Uh, we are in a very, very embryonic state of translating yeah. knowledge that is generated here to yeah. companies, to industry. I mean, I, I just know one or two, yeah. uh, less than two, <laughs> but it's one, uh, biotechnologies that, that became rich, that founded a company and, and so, so, so that's I think is a partial explanation why we don't have too much out, outreach to the political uh, oh. landscape. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. You know, um, I, I, I've seen, I see that I go all over the world and I see this and I always argue that uh, a country that doesn't feel that they can afford to, to have a competitive industry and simply will rely on, you know, big countries to do their work for them is missing an enormous opportunity, because the, the, you know you have the talent there. You have all these people. You have these bright people. They, if they were enabled to create these industries, they would flourish there, rather than having to come to California where it's so expensive to do anything be much less expensive to have an operation in Buenos Aires than in, uh, than in San Francisco. And yet all the biotech companies cluster in San Francisco or Boston. That's because we're, that's the, the talent is there. They're coming through the universities. That, that could happen anywhere. But instead what happens is the bright people who see this value will, will leave. They'll go to another country where they have more opportunities. So you, you lose your best, some of your best talent by not making that investment. Yeah. We have a Gabriela here. Um, Gabriela, do you want to make a comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for your previous answer <laughs> to my question. Uh, and uh, on another note, uh, but there is some aspect in which uh, for you not to go away with such a devastating panorama, <laughs> uh, there are some aspects uh, in which uh, our Congress people uh, do reach out for scientific advice. In fact, for instance, two colleagues from here, from the University of San Martin, mm -hmm. uh, have had uh, very important roles in um, uh, advising Congress people uh, to the uh, actually a, 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 a law that is presently being debated in the Congress uh, about the protection of wetlands. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, th there are some aspects in, in which uh, the Congress people, if, if it's not, uh, although it's not a, a very established relationship and uh, they do not have uh, people uh, on, on their payroll <laughs> yeah. for, for advice, but they sometimes do reach out. It, yeah. It's just uh, also an embryonic relationship and one that has to still much to grow, but yeah. uh, it's, it's there. Yeah, okay, well, that's a, that's a start. What you need to do is to convince your legislators to, to have staff, in-house staff, who are scientifically literate yeah. and who know where to go to get information and who mm -hmm. then have influence. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. So Randy, I think you covered most of the questions you had in the list. And then it, it's... Oh, wait, there's one from uh, Martin Blasco that we haven't touched on oh, yet. Oh, yeah, he, not one, but Martin Blasco, he made three questions. Okay, yeah. Martin, are you yeah. there? Well, I saw he was there. He was with the screen now. Well, he, one question he asks is, uh, what is my opinion of Sci-Hub? You, you probably, many of you know Sci-Hub. It's a, it's a pirate site. 
where uh, this one brave woman in Eastern Europe uh, has managed to get the entire, <laughs> at least life science literature. I don't know if she operates in the physical sciences, but she manages to get everything and just makes it available to anybody for free. So, um, you know, the major publishers are, would, would love to arrest her and put her in jail, but she's, uh, she's in a privileged uh, geographic location. I mean, it's not a solution to the problem. It's a, it's a symptom of the problem that she, that she has to exist. And it, where, when I travel, I find students all over the world use this sci-hub to, to evade the firewalls of these commercial journals. If the, if the commercial journals finally relent and, and favor open access, then you know this sci-hub will go away because it won't be necessary. So the commercial journals, of course, they've been fighting against this for years, but I think the, the walls are crumbling. These, these commercial journals are going to have to bend. Uh, but as I sent you this link, Susanna, to, to a new proposal from Nature, they're not going to bend without making a big profit. They, you know, these guys are just, they're, so my, my position is I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't like to publish in commercial journals, but unfortunately, they're very powerful. They branded themselves. So, but I think they're coming. Martin says he's here, but he's, he has his video camera off and a, a photo that shows him, oh, there you are. That photo is you 10 years ago. There, that's Martin Blasco now. So that's his second question. And he had his third question, which was, yes, yes, I yes. could not uh, under, understand his question. Can you? Do well, you his, first, his first question, which I didn't answer. Not. Yeah, his first question is, what is your opinion about going beyond the open access concept to a further step with open raw obligation for generating knowledge? Um, well, I, I think, um, uh, I still, I feel maybe I'm old fashioned, but I still feel there's, there's value added in peer review, anonymous peer review. Um, and so I, I, I hesitate to rely on just completely open, unfiltered science. I mean, that's what these archives do, but the experience is that most people who post on the, on the archives will, will seek publication in a journal that offers peer review. So I'm, 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 I'm hesitant in the life sciences at least, to do away with peer review. In, in, in areas such as uh, computer language, there are journals that, uh, you know, where everybody instantly has, has the programs and they, you know, they, they're assessed in real time. <laughs> uh, so anything that gets published, if, it's, if you call it publication, has been vetted. Um, that's harder to do in the life sciences as, as I illustrated earlier. So I, I think people should be open and that all the data that's, uh, that went into making a paper, all of it should be publicly available, but it should be vetted by peer review. That's, that's my opinion. And finally, Martin asks, <clears throat> most of the scientific editorial business gets pub get, um, get publishing material and revision services for free. That is, we are providing uh, free services. Uh, and even, uh, but, the, but the publishers then charge the authors to, pay, to publish a paper. And then there's the appropriation of copyright. They, they reserve that privilege for themselves. It's greedy, no question about it. I've railed against this um, on many occasions. And so how do you cut this Gordian knot as uh, Martin puts it? Well, uh, first of all, um, I, I, I urge you to, uh, to do business with not-for-profit publishers such as the PNAS or the scientific societies. Uh, and and uh, not all scientific societies are, are profit free. There are some very greedy scientific societies. Um, the American Cancer, uh, excuse me, the American Chemical Society makes a fortune. Make, they make hundreds of millions of dollars on their journals and their, their staff, their, 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 their society staff make huge salaries. They're, they're basically a business as far as I'm concerned. I would avoid them. Uh, the, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which publishes Science Magazine, also generates an enormous profit for Science Magazine. Now they don't spend it uh, for, you know, with shareholders and enriching their employees. 
they use it to promote science in the US, so that's a good cause, but still they charge an awful lot. And uh, it's definitely not a clean, not-for-profit as far as I'm concerned. But there are many journals um, in the life sciences, uh, PLOS and, and eLife and uh, PNAS and many other journals uh, run in a, in a pure not-for-profit manner. And I think these are the ones that we should use. It's, it's you know, I know it's easier said than done, but culture, changing a culture takes time and commitment. <laughs> and I've been doing my best to try to change that culture, but I need help. Good. Okay, thank you, Randy. Thank you for the wonderful talks. Thank you for, for being so open to our questions sure. and for your time. We will let you go for lunch now. I'm, okay. I'm aware you're missing lunch. And then uh, to all our audience, thank you very much for joining during this year. This is the last uh, event of the year and uh, we may see you, may not see you next year. So Randy, uh, now you have a commitment that whenever you are able, you are invited to come back to Universidad Nacional de San Martín because I'm having another idea, yeah? I will tell you when you come, yeah, I have, yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you, Susanna. Okay. Thank, thank you all. Good to so see you. so much, everyone, for joining us and uh, have a good uh, Christmas and Happy New Year. Yeah. Okay. And happy birthday to you, thank Randy, you. because I've seen you are, your birthday is coming soon on the 30th yeah, of December. Uh, at this point, at this point one, one doesn't wish to be reminded, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> the alternative is to not have a birthday, and that would be worse. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Thank so you, you are the host, uh, so you, you will, uh, whenever you switch off, we are all yeah. out. Okay, all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.